we need to create fair unemployment and good work for all, and that's uh, a very strong message as we, we face the biggest recession since the 1980s. I could have produced the, the evidence from the 1980s that showed a marked difference between the standard mortality of those on e in employment and those unemployed, and that we need to make sure we don't make that mistake again. We need to move towards good employment because the Whitehall study from Michael Marmot in the 1980s showed that it wasn't the chief executive who keeled over because of the stress at the age of 52. It was those lower down the hierarchy who had least control over their work. They had the worst health uh, and they died sooner. An interesting um, reflection, I was reading um, a biography of Winston Churchill last week and the comment was that during the Blitz in London, morale was particularly high because of the high levels of employment in the capital at that point in time. And it's just something we need to remind ourselves of uh, as, uh, as we go into this recession now. The people need an income to live healthy lives. Income inequalities has risen in England since 1977. The top earners earned significantly more through the 80s. Those at the bottom of the, the, the pile declined. Income tax is progressive, indirect tax is regressive. Before the current recession and the spending cuts, I haven't had time to do the calculations yet, but before that, the poor paid 38% of their income in taxes and the rich paid 34% of their income in taxes. That cannot be fair and it cannot be just. The evidence from London of a recent survey suggested that 50% of single parents with children do not have an income that would sustain good health. Nor should we think this is just an issue of the workless and the feckless. 1.7 million children live in families where their parents work, but they live in poverty. Uh, important concepts that we need to address. The importance of creating and developing sustainable places and communities was particularly important in our review. Danny Dawling's work, Professor of Social Geography uh, at Sheffield Hallam, uh, identifies how spatially segregated cities across England are. The importance of place in relation to mental well-being and the impact of space and environment on obesity and travel. If you don't feel safe, you don't go out. If you don't go out, you don't exercise. You don't take active travel. If you don't have integrated transport uh, within a, a community where you feel safe, then you will not take exercise. Children who live in deprived communities are five to seven times more likely to be involved in a traffic accident than if they live in richer communities. Uh, these are the realities that stand behind uh, some of our obesity figures and that we need to, to address. Our last uh, policy objective was around prevention. Prevention of illness and taking concerted action to ensure equality of provision and a reach of disease prevention and treatment. There's a clear inverse care law that kicks in in relation to prevention. Those areas that are healthiest have more GPs than those areas that are ill, Ill, Ill health. And we, we need to address that in the way in which we, we address the white paper. Primary care needs to find the missing millions. We know there are missing millions of patients with diabetes, with coronary heart disease, um, with obesity, um, who need a response from primary care and who aren't getting it at the moment. And that means upping our game, being more systematic and scaled up in the way we approach it, stop using project money and start using mainstream funding to address the issues of inequalities. We can't afford not to take action. Lost productivity as a consequence of health inequalities is about 33 billion pounds a year. Lost tax and benefits is 20 to 32 billion pounds a year. Health inequalities cost the NHS 5.5 billion pounds and 200,000 people aged 30 plus die prematurely every year. That's 40% of those people who die across England because of health inequalities. We need to address it. We need to ensure that equity and equality is at the heart of all our policies and that we use evidence bases in order to assess the interventions that we actually take and we're not doing so consistently uh, at the moment. Let's look at some of the evidence. This is um, cognitive development of children be it between the age of two and 10. Those people who live in um, 
the homes of higher economic status are in yellow, those who live in the poorer homes are in red. And if you look to the left hand side, you'll see the high developers up at 90. Those in red declined significantly between the age of two and a half and three and a half, and that decline continues uh, throughout their education in primary school. Look at the low scorers and see what happens. Those low scorers who live in the richest homes, they improve their development by two and a half to three and a half, and that development continues to improve as they move through primary school. This is the consequence. When you get to school, if you live in the poorer homes, you're half as likely to be ready for school at three. Your vocabulary will be worse at three and five. The only place where there's an inverse social gradient is in conduct problems. So children from poorer homes and across the gradient come to school with more barriers to them learning because they don't have the legacy that they bring with them in terms of their development and they have behavior problems that get in the way of their achievement at school. So let's move on to secondary school and see what happens. Well, this is achieving five A to C grades in maths and English at GCSE. Let me put that in a context for you. I was at UCL a couple of months back and I was talking to a young woman who was studying sociology and I said to her, what's your background? And she said, well, took my O levels, got nine A stars and an A. Took my A levels and I got two A stars and an A. And I said, great, and you wanted to do sociology? And she said, no, not likely. I wanted to do medicine, but I didn't have the grades to get in. Five A to C GCSEs is neither here nor there, and that's very important. But what we notice is that those in the most deprived of our communities, 25% of young people are getting five GCSEs, whereas in the least deprived, 68% are. But you'll see very clearly the social gradient across the graph. So even if we took really concerted action and we addressed the issues of the 0 to 10 and 10 to 20, and we drove the tail of the... Uh, of the, the, the social gradient upwards, then what are we going to do about the rest in the middle from 20 to 80%? Because they're still losing out as well. And that's a very important message uh, out of the review and needs to be taken on board in terms of policy. What this graph shows is standardized limiting illness at 2001 for people aged 16 to 74 by their educational status. Those that have degrees are on the left those that have no qualifications are on the right. And again, the social gradient is obvious. Those who have uh, two A levels, those that have five O levels, um, those that have uh, other qualifications are significantly healthier. Um, and um, that uh, demonstrates the, uh, the interlinkage of education and ill health. This is also an important um, graph that looks at the living environment uh, by neighbourhood income, looking at poor housing quality, air quality and road traffic accidents. And again, it shows you the same social gradient from the poorest communities uh, on the left to the richest communities on the right. I always joke that the richest communities are those are the ones where the GPs live. Um, and it makes a significant difference in relation to your life chances, your mental well-being, your resilience and your ability uh, to actually cope with stress. Social housing tends to be in the poorer areas. Good areas have better services. We can describe them, Danny Dawling described them in his work. There are green spaces, there are quality, there are trees, you can access services. It's a, a, a mixed economy where you can get round, where there are resources, where there are health centers, where there are gyms. Um, the inverse care law kicks in in relation to poorer areas. There's a clear geographically differentiated uh, social determinant of health. Social housing influences concentrations of un the unhealthy and the potentially unhealthy. Obesity impacts on ability to take exercise, concern for safety. I've talked about the incidence of road traffic accidents involving young people. Social networks and the loss of social support is absolutely critical uh, in relation to where you live. 